Hi gang, Rob here. It is the evening of 8 August 2018, a Wednesday evening, bringing you a From the Sharpening Bench video, a mini knife review on this beauty from Koenig Knives. And I'm sorry, Bill, uh, proprietor of Koenig Knives, I think I have butchered your last name six ways from Sunday. <clears throat> I think I've called the company Koenig, Koenig, and I have it on good authority. The correct pronunciation is Koenig, K-O-E-N-I-G. Let's uh, come in close on that maker's mark. There it is. The uh, knife we're looking at today is a relatively new offering from Koenig. This the Arius, A-R-I-U-S. A more conventional knife than the first one that I saw from Koenig, not the first knife that they made, but the one that got them the, the buzz, I think 2016 maybe, right after they opened. The knife was called the Zenaida, Z-E-N-A-I-D-A, -A, and it was a compact three inch class modern folder that had Fastenerless construction or screwless construction, very innovative, and I believe it won Blade Show Most Innovative Knife of the Year in 2016. Um, it was a pretty credible first effort, I thought, although a little odd and a little pricey. <clears throat> this knife, the Arius, much more in step with the group think of the modern folder industry in 2018. Let's go over the construction. We have a flipper on ball bearings, but not just any ball bearings. These are caged ceramic ball bearings. Also a ceramic ball bearing detent in this knife. Some nice uh, black oxided or PVD coated hardware. A titanium frame lock, <clears throat> bead blasted finish, some interesting milling tool marks in the relief cut for the lock bar. If I can focus on those, there you go. The lock up is attended to by the titanium lock bar. A very nice. Very nice and compact cut in that lock bar. A very discreet steel insert. Sort of pocketed into the lock bar so from the outside you don't see it at all. This jimping is in the titanium. Kind of a garish screw holding that thing in. It's pinned and screwed. And it also serves as an over travel stop which you can barely see if you look through right there. So nothing new here under the sun. You have a fully milled sculpted titanium pocket clip. Kind of neat. The window in the clip matches the window in the lock bar cutout. And it sort of flows with the theme of the similarly shaped hole in the blade. Backspacer is blue anodized titanium with a little bit of jimping. And then an integral lanyard loop in the backspacer. Pretty cool. Nicely executed. On this particular area, yes, we have a 3D machined and satin finished carbon fiber scale. There are many variations of this knife uh, right out of the gate. So you've got some all titanium knives with different finishes, some different milling patterns. Uh, this carbon fiber version. <clears throat> now this is not uh, this is not one that is internally milled with pockets to lighten the knife, but they do offer one that is. Um, just over, uh, I think the non-pocketed knife is just over four and a half ounces, and the one with pockets, 4.18, which is impressive considering a rather broad, 150 thousandths thick, three and a half inch blade of Carpenter CTS 204P steel, a brilliant steel. Finish on the blade is a stonewashed and I would say lightly acid stonewashed finish. This is rocking an 18 degree per side polished edge by yours truly. 
no micro bevel on this one. Uh, you know, it's very thin behind the edge. And no, notice the width of my 18 degree bevel. And I kind of wanted to keep sort of a factory look on this knife. It's thin enough you could probably back it up to 15 degrees and put a micro bevel on it, but I wanted to keep it uh, looking like just a nicer version of itself. So I didn't show you a bunch of edge on this one. Does it still cut? Um, yeah, what do you think? <clears throat> it does, nicely so. It is hollow ground, and the hollow grind in such a high grind, I think, is going to work extremely well as a slicer. There's enough distance between the cutting edge and this, uh, this shoulder that you're not going to have an abrupt transition there. So super slicey. It's going to shed material very well. Nicely designed. I suppose we would call this a harpoon drop point. No real clip, but we do have a little rise in this thumb ramp that resembles a harpoon. And a very interesting, deeply hollow ground swedge. I think you can pick that up. Pretty cool. A little fuller behind the opening hole. And the reason for the air quotes will become clear as we move along. You know, it's not in a place where it's going to grab material or have stuff build up in it. Just a nice aesthetic touch, I think. The handle is, uh, I'm saying it's sort of viper-like, you know, the sort of Vox Ness, Anso kind of viper-like. Uh, ergonomics are okay. Um, the middle finger doesn't quite know where to be. If I, I guess if you had thinner fingers than I do, it'd be better. It sort of reminds me of the Benchmade Contego. It's kind of a, a one and a half finger groove that leaves the middle finger on a point. <clears throat> if you backed up on it though, it would be more comfortable. I'm not sure you would ever grip the knife like that. But. In other grips, uh, pretty good. Draw cut, hammer, pretty good. Reverse grip, not so good. The uh, backspacer slash lanyard loop, we're going to make an extremely hot spot on your thumb if you wrap it in that fashion. I guess you could hammer grip or reverse grip it like that with plenty of security. <clears throat> but very buttoned up. I think the blade and handle have some visual tension that makes sense. The blade, I think, is, uh, the, you know, the, the relationship to the handle notwithstanding, I think the blade is fairly attractive. Um, and certainly functional, even though it's got some pretty cool style elements. Construction seems to be extremely precise. There is your blade centering, which is perfect. Flipping action is really good. Let's see with some fingers on the lock bar how we do. Death lock. Death lock with fingers on the lock bar. And A related issue, if you're right-handed and you hold the knife in a natural way and try to use that opening hole, you're pressing against your fingers again on the lock bar. Uh, a lefty like me can open it just fine. And I can flip it without worry if I rest my thumb up here on the frame. You know, this is a, a casualty of modern knife think. We have to have a strong detent. So our flipping action is awesome. Well. You know, we, we used to have knives we could get out pretty fast without half the detent ball exposed into a hole in the blade that causes it to lock itself shut if you're putting any pressure on that detent ball whatsoever. A lot of ZTs suffer from that. Um, frankly, we knives seems to avoid it most of the time. It's just not a good thing. You know, if, if we were actually using this modern tactical folder in a tactical application like we were in a knife fight, maybe our gun jammed, and we grabbed it with lots of adrenaline and a strong grip and used the flipper. It ain't coming open. just ain't coming open, so then we have a kubaton. Uh, we don't have a knife. But for the tactical couch, uh, for the tactical, tactical couch operator, this is perfect. 
you know, if you really pay attention and you get some good muscle memory going while you're flipping it watching Sons of Anarchy on the couch, it's, it works just fine. Sorry for the sarcasm. It's just, uh, you know, I, I now and then I have these little axes to grind. That's one of them. No need for that detent to be like that. Uh, especially when you consider how free and smooth the action of this knife is. It would flip just fine with a detent done correctly. And this is not correctly. Okay. Uh, you could still make a nice firm detent without it burying itself in the blade to the equator and locking itself closed. Um, so that's one bone to pick I have and we'll get to the other one uh, now. Uh, construction, although precise, the parts seem to be machined very precisely. Um, <clears throat> construction is not, uh, does not benefit from engineering wisdom. Uh, there's one locator on this knife and it's the pivot. What I mean by a locator, what orients the two sides of the handle in this direction. There are no locating pins in this backspacer. The backspacer is threaded to accept four screws. Um, and I've talked about this before. If you're a tool maker and you're making a fixture, you know that screws hold components together, pins precisely machined, and holes precisely machined orient things this way. Screws hold things together, locating pins orient parts. Um, you, know, how, you know, how does the Sabenza do that? It does it with essentially pivot barrels through all three fastening locations. So you have a male screw threading into a female pivot barrel. The pivot barrel is the locating pin. So your pin and your screw are in the same location, but still you have that positive locatability. And we'll get to why this knife is on the table <clears throat> as we go on. Uh, does it affect this knife's perfect centering in this case? Nope. Would it be possible for me to put this knife together with these scales shifted so it would affect centering? I bet I could. Uh, at least, you know, if, at least on some of the models, they have a little bit sloppy thread fit. Okay. Um, but overall, a very credibly executed knife. You know, I mentioned the Viper products. Um, we can talk about Lion Steel products, um, Spartan Blades, other knives that are sort of small company production knives uh, that are of similar style and construction. Um, it's a competitive offering, or it would be, if it didn't cost so darn much. This knife in this configuration, I believe, although it's out of stock, was at a web price at your favorite retailer of $590. And frankly, uh, this product line, the Arius line, ranges all the way up into the mid-700s. Um, so how is that competitive with even the, uh, uh, the giant mouse knives made by Viper, the most expensive low volume vipers there are those knives are in the you know three to four hundred dollar range this one 590 590 now you know there are other knives aren't there production knives which are priced let's say more than the sum of their parts here's one it's the oldie and the goodie right this is a plain jane base model sabenza large variety first one I ever bought it is six years old and still works like the day it was brand new and it's made by a company that's uh, just about 30 years old into its second generation of ownership and operation going strong in Boise Idaho this knife a pattern they've been making for goodness gracious over a decade the large Sabenza 21 and Sabenza's as a whole for over 25 years the company is set up to be able to service this knife forever uh, warranty issues are handled promptly and easily 
and they also do paid service on these knives for what is it 35 40 bucks I can send this knife in with all of its battle scars and wear and snail trails and stuff even, even if I had my blade scratched up it's re stonewash that for me and uh, send it back to me looking like a brand new Sabenza they'll do that forever and they have a 30 year track record that says that's a credible policy right they're gonna be around uh, this knife as they've been for a long time I think 415 bucks for a basic clip point all titanium Sabenza let's say you take this same knife throw a carbon fiber scale on it as Chris Reeves done I think in collaboration with a knife art exclusive so you've got something very similar to this albeit without ball bearings um, that knife the carbon fiber Sabenza is, is 485 this knife with titanium on both sides and no extra goodies is 490 and as configured 590 so clearly and you could make the case that you know a 50 or 75 bucks of that could be a ball bearing pivot and a flipper but what are you really buying you know why does this knife cost twice what a similar spider coat would cost built pretty much the same way without a bushing pivot of course because of what you get the lifestyle that you get the service that you get from that company on this knife as long as you and your son will own it okay you know, can Koenig knives compete in that arena of value I don't know it's a two-year-old company so where does the value come from I guess would be my question for Koenig knives it's not significantly different or better than other modern folders that are similarly equipped it's a CNC made production knife there goes that death lock again and it's credible it's a $300 knife maybe 350 it is not a $590 knife um, but here's here we have one of these situations reference a video I made some years ago uh, about young or new makers with great promise and how we support them I'll put a link to that video in the description I actually featured a guy in that video who let's say hasn't lived up to the support we've given him but that's neither here nor there Bill Koenig a guy in his what mid 20s um, who has has really shown great promise makes a great product um, his design his design eye I think is evolving nicely seems to be a great guy who has visions of operating a great company you know if he needs five hundred and ninety dollars a knife in order to build that business and we as knife collectors consumers users if we perceive this guy to be a worthy investment is this something we should buy I say yes on paper with all things considered is it objectively worth 590 bucks no way but should we pay 590 for it if we like it and we want to see him succeed absolutely we should because this young man is absolutely rocking it by the way this fully milled sculpted pocket clip goes in and out of the pants slickly and retains well how about that you don't see that every day just an adequate amount of tension but not overly tensioned and we have enough ramp in the end of that clip to get over the top seam of your pocket um, without protruding in a way that's going to snag on stuff it's just really well done and by the way a d-shaped pivot so as it flips open and smacks against the stop pin it's not going to come loose it's not going to turn in the handle you can precisely tension it only worrying about the male pivot screw beautifully done beautifully done 
So on balance, is the Arius a good knife? Heck yeah, it's a good knife. By the way, if you read Bill's bio on his website, he spent a time spent a lot of time at a local knife company in Boise, Idaho. Yes, he did. Plying his trade. I don't know what that company was. I really don't. Um, but it sure seems as though he might have learned from the he might have learned from a really persnickety master. I don't know. I haven't talked with him. I don't know that story. But the Arius, a pretty cool knife. Glad to see it on the market. Support Koenig knives, I say. That's all for this one. Grace to you and peace, my friends, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And remember the word and this Koenig Arias are sharp.